I've been working in wrestling media for a few years now and I've noticed a pattern. And I will admit, I'm not the first person to have noticed this, of course, because oh, it's bleeding obvious. But interest in wrestling is at its highest from January through to WrestleMania. It will pick up again a little bit leading into SummerSlam and Survivor Series, but it never quite reaches the level of that January through April period. There are a portion of wrestling fans who switch off for three quarters of a year and only watch those first four months. And when those months are over, they switch off again and go about their lives until the next January rolls around. The lucky bastards. These fans are clearly only interested in what happens at WrestleMania, and that's obvious because they tune out when it's all said and done. But they know to come back in January because the Royal Rumble kicks off the now branded Road to WrestleMania story. The winners of the men's and women's matches will be the focal point for the next few months, as well as any other storylines that are started within the match itself. And those winners are going to the main event of WrestleMania, or sometimes the opening match, to, depending on how important WWE sees them. The Royal Rumble match is perhaps the most important date in every wrestling fan's calendar. A date to get excited about because, well, there's a lot to be excited about. Who will win the matches? Will there be any weird matchups that we've not seen before? Will there be some surprise cameos, NXT call-ups, or shock returns? Now, I, I may come across as a bit of a grump about wrestling sometimes, especially if you watch our Raw reviews, but I genuinely get so excited for the Rumble, sometimes more than WrestleMania itself. But is the Royal Rumble actually good? Before we crack on with this video, please do consider giving Parts of Unknown a subscribe and this video a thumbs up. You can also support us on patreon.com forward slash Parts of Unknown where you can get cool perks like early access and be featured in this series like some of our awesome Patreon backers will be later on in this episode. The Royal Rumble match was devised by the late Pat Patterson who wanted to adapt the already popular Battle Royal by staggering the entrances as opposed to having all the guys in the ring at the same time. Going by certain interviews, Vince McMahon was not a fan of the idea, and it was only when Dick Ebersol of NBC approached him about doing a special episode of Wrestling on USA Network, he turned to Pat Patterson and said, Tell Dick about your stupid idea, pals. Those are Pat Patterson's words for the record, though I don't think he did it in that same accent. The idea was tried out on a house show in St. Louis, Missouri on October 4th, 1987, which was won by One Man Gang, and then moved to television for that USA Network special, with Jim Duggan winning the 20-man version. It was so popular and did good enough numbers that it became WWF's fourth pay-per-view extravaganza after WrestleMania, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series, the first airing in 1989 and won by Big John Studd. WWF always used the match to build storylines like that first showdown between Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior in 1990, but that all changed when the stipulation was added that the winner will get a title shot in the main event of WrestleMania 9, which Turned out really well for eventual winner Yokozuna. And that stipulation has become a yearly tradition, adding some much needed stakes to the match itself, as it essentially tells you, the audience, what to expect from WrestleMania in a couple of months time. And fans generally love the Rumble concept. Even when Royal Rumbles are a bit rubbish and bland, they have their moment. Those surprise returns, the shock cameos, the unbelievable eliminations. You can look at pretty much every Royal Rumble in history and say, yeah, that was an awesome moment. 2001 is my favorite Rumble match of all time, for obvious reasons, but even if the Rumble sucked, you could look at that Drew Carey moment and laugh at how ridiculous it all was, and it's only made better by the fact the friggin' Honky Tonk Man comes out for more comedy with Kane. The 2011 Rumble is fine, but it's mostly remembered for that Diesel cameo and the Santino Morella moment at the end. The 2000 Rumble is a bit of a mess if we're all being honest, but I could watch Too Cool Dance again and again and again, and the ending with Rock and Big Show did lead to some really fun storytelling in the following weeks. And yeah, 2001 is my favourite Rumble, but 
everyone has their own. Whether it's 1992 for the Ric Flair win and Bobby Heenan commentary, the 1995 match with the Shawn Michaels near elimination and eventual win, 1998 for the Austin win, 1999 for Vince McMahon shenanigans, 2002 for Triple H's return, 2005 for Vince McMahon tearing quad shenanigans, 2006 for the Eddie Guerrero tribute, 2007 for Undertaker vs HBK, 2010 for Edge, 2016 for the AJ Styles debut, 20 18 for that old versus new showdown and Shinsuke Nakamura and Asuka bloody winning the thing. 2019 for Becky Lynch's awesome win and 2020 for the rise of Drew McIntyre to stardom. Each rumble has its own flavor, its own uniqueness, its own purpose, and it all depends on what you want. The 2001 rumble is perfect for me as it has that balance of comedy, the hardcore nonsense with Raven, star power out the wazoo, multiple potential winners, Kane running wild and Steve Austin getting the big win at the end which is what we all wanted to see. Sean Rossap over at Fightful recently released a brilliant piece talking about how Rumble matches are put together with multiple interviews from people who've been in them. Really go and check it out, it's linked in the video description down below. It's fascinating to see how this match, which usually goes over an hour and has 30 or more people involved, is planned out. I've watched backstage meetings at local indie shows where they try to book and map out a rumble style match and there are so many plates spinning. Like a Hollywood movie with all of the politics and egos, it's amazing a rumble even gets finished, let alone runs smoothly. Like in the 30 plus years that WWE have been doing Royal Rumbles, only one match has really gone awry and that was the 2005 finish with the aforementioned Vince McMahon quad daring. That's really, really impressive. But outside of those moments, are the matches actually good? Well, for that, we're gonna have to turn to our old friend, Science. Right, okay, here we go. I have got the ratings for every single Royal Rumble match in history, every single one with the exception of 1993, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Or maybe I'll do that now. Um, yeah, Dave Meltzer didn't rate the 1993 Rumble because, come on, scroll. I don't, don't need your prompt. Don't need your prompt, mate. No, I don't wanna leave a comment. I don't wanna rate this with stars. Parts were very good, even excellent by Battle Royal standards. Others were bad by any standard. So there you go. I don't think, well, well, I mean, spoilers, I don't think it would have drastically affected the uh, overall average rating. But let's get into it. So, 1988, two and a half stars. 1989, two and a half. 1995, that's three and a half stars. 1990, you know, oh, I dropped some. Oof, 1999, one, one and a half stars. Yeah, it wasn't very good, folks. It, it wasn't very good. 2001, three and a quarter stars. The third best rumble, according to Meltzer, thus far. Ah, oh, bollocks, it's already been beaten by 2002, two and a half stars. The 2004 rumble, which was won by Stephen Richards. Our new best people, the 2007 Royal Rumble, four big stars there. Well done, you. Three and a quarter stars for 2012. I think that's f generous. Ah, 2014. Objectively, one of the Royal Rumbles of all time. Three and a half stars by Dave Meltzer. However, the 2015 Rumble, which is a very, very bad Rumble, and WWE should be ashamed of themselves. A star and three quarters. It's not the lowest though, it's not the lowest. I thought it might, but it's not. 1999, still the lowest one with Vince McMahon winning, but 2015, the big dog. Four stars for the 2016 Rumble. Crikey. 2020, that is four and a quarter stars. This feels very chaotic at the moment. Look at this absolute madness that I've just blue tacked onto my brand new house wall. Like it's various variations of the same thing. It's three and a quarter, it's three and three quarters, it's three and a half. But I did notice looking through all of this though, is that they do kind of get gradually better. Like look, like, like here you got, you know, four and a quarter, three and, is it three and a quarter? All the best rumbles seem to have come in like quite recent memory. 
particularly like in these last three, but you know, that, that's a good rumble. That, the 2016 one got four stars. You kind of compare that to some of these older ones, which are sort of like these kind of middling matches. And I think that's the 90s in particular is certainly a way to look at the Royal Rumble and be like, yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah, it's a good rumble that. Yeah, I liked it, it's a good rumble. But I think now that WWE have really started to like love the Royal Rumble and, and fans love the Royal Rumble, we are getting more like, character. It doesn't quite help the average though, because yeah, the average star rating for a Royal Rumble, according to Big Daddy Dave Meltzer, is three and a quarter stars. That's, that's average, right? Like it's three stars. It's good in fact, it's better than average. And I kind of think that's fair. Because like Dave's looking at it from like a match type perspective, right? Like he's looking at it from like the spots and like the way that it was booked and the way that it's mapped out and things like that. So I kind of think that Dave is right. Yeah, I think that three and a quarter stars is probably a, a fair assumption of the Royal Rumble match in terms of is it actually good? I've also got star ratings for the women's one. Uh, because we did, you know, we do now have a women's Royal Rumble as well. We had 2018, 2019 and 2020. I was going to do them as separate pieces of paper, but I thought, what's the f***ing point? Because three and a quarter stars, three and a quarter stars, three and a half stars. Like, it's different shades of beige, you know what I mean? Like, it, 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 it's variations of that was a good match. What's frustrating about all of this is that the science portion of this is usually a really good indication of whether some... Like look back at the Charlotte one. We were asking, like, whether Charlotte is actually good, and we were able to compare her with Becky Lynch. We were able to compare her with some other people. I cannot remember who we compared her to now, but, like, the star rating sort of reflected, like, she is objectively really good. Like, actually good. I don't know if these star ratings prove whether the Royal Rumble is actually good. What this proves is that the Royal Rumble is good. Does that make sense? Did this achieve anything? Have I made any, I don't know. Was this good? I don't know. Did this prove anything? Is the Royal Rumble actually good? What a stupid question. The Royal Rumble to me is so much fun because you never know who's gonna come out, what silly thing is gonna happen, and it just keeps your adrenaline going the entire time. And I watch wrestling to be entertained and I can't think of anything more entertaining than the Royal Rumble. It's the greatest mass stipulation in all professional wrestling. Like every 90 seconds, you don't know what's gonna be a guy from Raw, SmackDown, unless you haven't seen him four or five years or a guy from NXT. There's dream matches happening in that match. There's moments happening in that match. Sometimes it could be someone of the opposite gender getting into the ring and tearing it up, which is always the craziest thing in the world to see. I, as a person who loves gimmicky matches, I'm a bit biased. However, I do recognize that it is a match that is very hard to book properly in a way that would read as a logical wrestling match and that would not damage anyone's character. And this year we're faced with Royal Rumble without the crowd, which the crowd is a huge factor in it. And it forced me to ask the question, is the crowd and their reaction the whole reason that Royal Rumble is fun? I battle ADHD uh, daily. I was medicated until I was in high school and it was very hard to focus. But one thing I could focus on was pro wrestling. But even then, sometimes it was a little difficult. 1990, you're sitting through a bunch of punches and kicks and chin locks, not in the Royal Rumble. Every 60 seconds, a new wrestler comes out or 90 seconds, whatever the hell it is. You've got a new person out there, a fresh face, offense, constantly throughout the entire match. It was perfect for me. It really accentuated my love of pro wrestling. The Royal Rumble isn't just good, it's great. Besides the greatest Royal Rumble, that was, yeah. As always, we took this question to Twitter to see what you thought, and unsurprisingly, given how popular the Rumble is among fans, 93.4% voted for yes, it was actually good. That is the highest percentage of yes votes we've ever had in the short history of this series. It looks like the Rumble is universally beloved. The Rumble is just as good as the winner. The whole match can be five stars, but if the wrong person wins, then it becomes bad. It's one of the most fun things in wrestling where we count down to the next entrant and either boo or cheer. It also creates stars like Drew and many others. So yes, it is actually good. A good Rumble is the best thing ever. Stories all throughout. Do you want to heckin' fight me? 
The concept is so great that even the worst ones are entertaining, thanks to the element of intrigue. Hardly anything is better and more fulfilling than a well-booked rumble. Yes, yes, and yes. It's the only match of WWE's I will watch annually, without fail, regardless of what else is going on in the company. The Royal Rumble is the closest thing we get to an epic storyline in a single match. Multiple plot points crossing over, starting new feuds on the road to the big season finale, WrestleMania. Almost every other promotion tries to capture the same lightning in a bottle. Most can't. One of the bits of feedback that really jumped out to me there was the idea that the Rumble lives and dies by its winner. Yeah, there have been classic Rumbles, but there have also been some bad Rumbles. And I'm not talking about the ones where it's a bit boring. I mean the ones that have actively pissed off the audience. Like, what if the Royal Rumble is actually bad? The 1996 Rumble is really lacking in star power, showing why WWF's popularity was waning in favour of the new and fresh WCW. The 1998 Rumble is great for Austin and the three faces of Foley, but the rest of it is a who's who of who gives a f The 99 Rumble is memorable for sure, but the match itself is more of an angle, just more building of that McMahon-Austin storyline. For the first time since its inception, it wasn't about who won the Rumble. Vince McMahon won, but he didn't headline WrestleMania. Austin, the guy who lost, did. And in a way, the same can be said for the 2000 Rumble. And then we get into the stretch of time that is just about hated by every single wrestling fan on the planet. Please do prove me wrong in the comments on this, because we had the niceness of Edge winning in 2010, but Alberto Del Rio won in 2011, and it didn't matter a jot for him or his destiny when he lost the opening match of WrestleMania against Edge. Sheamus won in 2012 when it should have been Chris Jericho. John Cena won in 2013, which was a foregone conclusion as fans could see a million miles off that we were heading towards twice in a lifetime with The Rock. And we weren't exactly excited about it this time because it came at the expense of CM Punk's excellent WWE Championship run. The 2014 Rumble is an absolute disaster, with WWE not realising that Daniel Bryan was the hottest thing in wrestling and omitted him from the Rumble entirely. So, fans booed eventual winner Batista, who was supposed to be the big return of the year, and booed poor Rey Mysterio because he had the temerity to not be Daniel Bryan. And just when you thought WWE could not be more deaf with their 2014 booking, they had the temerity to book the 2015 Rumble where they put Daniel Bryan in it and eliminated him in 10 minutes so we could all focus on Roman Reigns and The Rock. It was a clear indication that WWE do not care what you as fans think. They want Roman, so you're getting Roman. Screw your yes chance. 2016 wasn't much better, again being built around Roman Reigns and Triple H winning the WWE Championship, which no one other than Triple H and Vince McMahon wanted to see. And despite having some new, fresh, emerging stars that people were genuinely getting behind, WWE used the Royal Rumble to have Randy Orton win so he could beat Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania in a storyline that did not need the WWE Championship. The 2018 Royal Rumble was the first time in ages where WWE tried something new. They had hot stars Asuka and Shinsuke Nakamura win. It's a shame that neither won their title at WrestleMania, Asuka lost her undefeated streak to Charlotte who didn't need to do so, and her Rumble win was overshadowed by the debuting Ronda Rousey, but after years and years of bad Rumble winners, at least it was a shining light that something new and someone different won. But even when I write that down and even when I relive those disappointments, particularly 2014, 15 and 17, I can't help but think the Royal Rumble is great. I mean, it's the freaking Royal Rumble. This tweet reply really caught my eye. When you get to the heart of it, it's the countdown and that buzzer. In that moment, the clarion call of anything can happen in the WWF rings truest be that a new signing, an NXT call-up, or a returning legend. WWE have always spouted that line, anything can happen in the World Wrestling Federation, and we've seen as wrestling fans that anything usually means 
what we want even if you don't. But with the Rumble, it's, it's the start of a new season in many ways. And it can sort of be compared to a TV show that had a poor season you didn't like. I didn't like season four of Buffy the Vampire Slayer because Adam was a weak villain, the army stuff was total pish, and Riley was somehow less charismatic than Angel. But season five had a brilliant villain in glory, the fate of Joyce. That episode made me cry a whole bunch. The introduction of Scrappy Dawn and a fantastic conclusion. So yeah, while it took me nearly six months to get through season four of Buffy the Vampire Slayer because it was so boring in the back of my head, I always knew that season five would be a fresh start. And I binged through season five really quickly because I enjoyed it so much. And that's what the Royal Rumble is to a lot of fans. Those fans that don't watch what happens after WrestleMania. They may not have enjoyed Sheamus, Randy Orton, Batista, Roman Reigns or Triple H winning, but they'll be back in January to see the start of the new season. Hoping this time that Buffy isn't fighting someone as shit as Adam. Is the Royal Rumble actually good? Yeah, it's, it's more than good. It's necessary. And also it's f***ing brilliant. Is the Royal Rumble actually good? What a stupid question. I know it's the gimmick. I know it's the premise. I don't care. Why would you even leave open for interpretation? Leave any, any room for error for idiots that don't think the Royal Rumble is actually good?